Okay, we left off on Monday going through the electron transport chain. So now we've moved on from fermentation and we're talking about respiration, the more efficient way to generate energy. And so we were kind of rushing towards the end, but hopefully the electron transport chain is a review for most of you. Um, but basically, we're just taking the electrons that have come from all of the oxidation steps in glycolysis or hopefully the TCA cycle, feeding them in at one point, having the electrons pass from one member of the electron transport chain to another, um, with occasional coupling points where you have proton motor force being generated. So when you see the protons coming across, that's the generation of the proton motor force. And then in aerobic respiration, which is what we what you have studied the most, at the end of this system, you have the cytochromes putting these electrons to their final resting place which is on oxygen, and when you produce oxygen, you produce harmless water. Wonderful, wonderful system invented by bacteria. We're all using it in our mitochondria. But in bacteria, there's a lot more diversity in terms of the electron transport chain, and that's what makes bacterial respiration so much more interesting than the respiration that we're doing. Now, before we get into things like anaerobic respiration, which is something that bacteria can do that we cannot, Let's talk a little bit about how it is that those members of the electron transport chain can carry electrons. We talked about the importance of iron and how iron was imported by bacteria. And here's one of the reasons why iron is so important. It's not simply um, as an electron carrier, as it is here in these um, prosthetic groups. Iron can be used as a cofactor in other enzymes as well. But we're talking about respiration, so I just wanted to introduce the prosthetic groups that bacteria and eukaryotes and archaea use, where they take metals and nucleate them within prosthetic groups. So in this particular case, this is a porphyry ring made up of four pyroles um, that can now be attached as if it is a prosthetic limb to a protein. That's why it's called a prosthetic group. It's not synthesized along with the protein. So a prosthetic group like this heme shown here, this porphyrin ring, is not synthesized by the ribosome when the ribosome made this cytochrome protein. It's added later as a prosthetic. And usually, oftentimes, usually oftentimes, I don't know if those two terms should go together, but in this particular case, you'll see that um, sulfur is often involved as a way to attach these prosthetic groups, especially those containing iron. So amino acids like cysteine are very important here because they have sulfur. So sulfur will help to bind this, this prosthetic group. And so from the point of view of electron transport chain, you all recognize from GenChem that iron can exist in both oxidized and re reduced forms. So it's a good electron carrier and an electron donor. So, so electrons can alternatively be, given, be put onto this. So in other words, it can be reduced. And if we oxidize, the electrons can be passed on. So iron is critical um, for many steps in the electron transport chain. Not all. Some, some of the members in the electron transport chain don't have iron at all. So another example of a prosthetic group that's widely used in the electron transport chain is a little bit simpler. These iron-sulfur clusters. So you can have iron-2, sulfur-4, iron-4, sulfur-8 clusters. Really doesn't matter, it's just, a, it's just a size thing, a complexity thing. But here, without all of the complexity of the pyroles and the heme, you can have iron uh, directly attached to cysteines. Again, because cysteine has sulfur, cysteine is very often used in, in this type of an attachment. So this would be a simpler prosthetic group where you would now have multiple iron molecules that could be alternatively oxidized and reduced. So in terms of electron movement, this is a, a wonderful system. So these are just a couple of important prosthetic groups. Now, here is uh, another, this is perhaps a little bit further review. So this is just a hypothetical electron transport chain that, that I drew. But here you can see, and again, I don't want you to remember the individual components of this, 
short of remembering that NADH here is the ele reduced electron carrier that's probably coming from either the TCA cycle or the glycolytic pathway. But here these electrons need to be taken off because if for no other reason, the regeneration of the NAD plus is critical. Otherwise, oxidation shuts down, glycolysis shuts down, the TCA cycle shuts down. So in a way, this is no different than the fermentation pathway because the bacterium is getting rid of the electron here to regenerate NAD plus. But in the electron transport chain, again, the organism has evolved to take advantage of the fact that these electrons have energy. And so they can pass through this um, NADH dehydrogenase to a flavor protein. And here is a coupling point, an example of a coupling point. So as the electrons pass from flavor protein to a non-heme iron sulfur cluster molecule, um, the protons can't go with it. The electrons can be passed along, but the protons that have been taken up from the cytoplasm are now shunted to the outside. So this process is always taking protons, which are largely coming from the spontaneous ionization of water in the cytoplasm, which always occurs at a relatively low rate. But this is usually the, the source for most of these protons. But the protons are pumped out at these coupling points. So the electron gets passed on to a quinone, which is this vitamin K derivative, um, which can take up a proton or two protons. But then when it passes it on to the cytochromes, the protons are dumped across. So you see the generation of the proton motor force. And again, the final resting place of that electron is on, in this case, oxygen producing water. So this is what you and I do now, or some variation of this, using our mitochondria. Um, don't know why I put this slide in again. I perhaps had another point that I was going to make, but I don't remember what it is. So you all recognize the importance in our lives and in bacteria's lives of, of aerobic respiration. But we also use the cytochromes and the diversity of cytochromes in bacteria as diagnostic tests. So this is a diagnostic test that you'll do in the laboratory in a few weeks where we can compare bacteria that undergo electron transport to see whether or not they have a particular cytochrome Oxidase. So, you and, so cytochrome C oxidase is a particular cytochrome that some bacteria have that can undergo aerobic respiration, but not all bacteria have this. So for instance, E. coli doesn't have this kind of a pathway. E. coli can use oxygen, but it can also use other electron acceptors. So it uses a different cytochrome C oxidase. So what people have, inventive people have come up with a way to help diagnose bacteria in the laboratory is that they found that there is, and again, I'm not interested in you remembering this chemical or the chemistry behind this, because if I didn't have this slide in front of me, I couldn't tell you the name of this chemical. But this chemical that only a chemist could love, nn dimethyl p phenylene diamine, is a colorless molecule. So you can either um, put it onto bacteria, or you can rub bacteria onto, the, onto these slides. And in the oxidized, or, or the colorless form, it can be oxidized to a purple form. So what happens is that this molecule, this chemical colorless molecule, can, if this cytochrome C oxidase is present, this cytochrome C oxidase can take electrons directly from this colorless molecule, so they, so, so they oxidize it. The reduced form is purple. So this is a very quick test to, to tell whether a bacterium is oxidase positive. As a matter of fact, it's very important clinically because those of you who, who become clinicians will realize that, for instance, if you're trying to diagnose a, a patient who potentially has gonorrhea, if you do a gram stain of exudate from that person's mucosal exudate and you see a gram-negative diplococcus and you can show that it is um, positive in a cytochrome oxidase test, which takes only a few seconds to do, that's a presumptive positive for, for Neisseria. Um, so, so it's a very important diagnostic tool. So my point here is mostly that it's important that you understand the electron transport chain and bacterial physiology in general, because it's so critical to our abilities to differentiate bacteria in the laboratory, pathogens from non-pathogens, or even just distinguishing species. And since you'll use this test, I thought you should 
um, see this. So these bacteria that have this type of um, cytochrome C oxidase, I had always thought up until um, just not that long ago that they were obligately aerobic. So that would mean that these were bacteria that, like you and I, could only use oxygen at the end of their electron transport chain. As it turns out, there are a few that are facultatively anaerobic. So this would be a bacterium like E. coli, but E. coli doesn't fit into this. Because some of these bacteria have a different cytochrome oxidase that can reduce nitrate. I probably shouldn't even bring that up because it's probably just more confusing than it's worth. But I had been teaching that wrong for several years, so I felt necessary to correct it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the diversity of electron transport and, at the same time, address why it is that oxygen is the best electron acceptor. Why it is that that's why you and I use oxygen as opposed to nitrate or sulfate um, or iron as our terminal electron acceptors. So this is an example from E. coli. So E. coli actually has at least, well, I think at least three different electron transport chains that it can use on different occasions. So that's much more complex than you and I have. We have only one electron transport chain. We're going to talk about two of them here that are both used in aerobic respiration. So just by definition, remember that E. coli is what we refer to as a facultative anaerobe. That is, it can use oxygen when oxygen is available, but if oxygen is not available, it can simply switch and use a different electron acceptor. Again, something that you and I aren't able to do. But E. coli has this um, branched pathway where it can take the electrons from NADH in the cytoplasm, again, coming from the Krebs cycle or from glycolysis. It can dump them into the electron transport chain into this iron sulfur cluster protein onto coenzyme Q, this quinone, that, can, that is now reduced. So you can recognize this QH2, that's the reduced form of quinone. So now these electrons on quinone can go in either of two directions depending on how available oxygen is. So like in the laboratory this week, you're dealing with E. coli that's growing, being shaken in a baffled flask. So there's lots of oxygen being bubbled through that media. So that would be a condition what we would refer to as high aeration. So in that particular case, when oxygen is not limited, E. coli can sense that oxygen is a very high concentration, and it will express and use this BO branch. Um, B, B and O are abbreviations for cytochromes. So cytochrome B and cytochrome O will be expressed under high oxygen concentration. So this is a really good way for the bacterium to take electrons from the electron transport chain. It uses copper as well. Um, but eventually, it's going to put those electrons onto water, excuse me, onto oxygen to produce water. And you'll see that proton motor force is generated. Now, the mathematics here, the arithmetic, make a little bit of difference. Notice that here in the bottom, in the BO branch, there are four protons that are coming across here. So in terms of generating proton motor force, this system, which uses oxygen when it's at a high level, is much more efficient than the system that E. coli will use as oxygen begins to be depleted. O e. coli will use oxygen to the exclusion of any other electron acceptor until oxygen is literally completely scrubbed from the environment. Oxygen is that good it will actually now express a different form of this terminal cytochrome oxidase under lower oxygen tension. So the BD branch still has cytochrome B, but it has now a different cytochrome associated with it, cytochrome D. This system will now take electrons from the reduced coenzyme Q through coenzyme, excuse me, cytochrome B, and now differently than the BO branch, it will put them onto cytochrome D, which still has the ability to reduce oxygen to water. But again, notice the proton motor force. Only two protons come across for this. So this system is much less efficient. This system has a very high affinity for oxygen. The cytochrome D will bind oxygen at almost femtomolar <coughs> levels, so when it's at a very, very low oxygen tension. The BO branch has a much lower affinity. 
So it's only good when oxygen is in a high supply. Uh, but the bacteria will, as oxygen levels decrease, and so the BO branch is no longer efficient because it doesn't have a high affinity for the oxygen, will switch over, begin to express cytochrome D, and so now the terminal cytochrome oxidase has got a higher affinity for oxygen, but it can't generate quite as much proton motor force. It will use this until oxygen is gone. If that were you and I, when oxygen was gone, we would suffocate, we, we would die. Um, but E. coli has the ability to express yet a third <coughs> cytochrome oxidase that will allow it when oxygen is gone, if nitrate is present, NO3, E. coli can use a different form of that cytochrome oxidase to now put those electrons onto nitrate to generate nitrite. This tower of reduction potential will obviously is showing you why E. coli will always use oxygen in preference to nitrate. Because if you look at this in terms of the reduction potential, so here's the electron transport chain in a way. Here are the electrons coming in from NADH through the flavor proteins, through the iron sulfur proteins, through quinone cytochromes. And here are the terminal electron acceptors. Notice the numbers here. So the greater the distance that an electron falls, if you will, through this tower, the greater the reduction potential is. And that means more energy can be extracted. So more proton motive force is generated. So if E. coli takes the electrons from NADH and pumps them through and can go all the way down to reduce oxygen, it gets the benefit of all of the energy. So the reduction potential going from a minus 0.3 to a plus 0.75. That's a significant increase in energy than if the bacteria had dumped the electrons onto nitrate, reducing them to nitrate. Because you see that the reduction potential has a, has a lower value. So the electron will not generate as much energy if it ends up reducing nitrate to nitrite. But unlike you and I, who would suffocate if oxygen was gone, E. coli has the ability to say, okay, oxygen is gone. But rather than just rely on fermentation, which is very inefficient, doesn't produce very much energy at all, instead the electrons go on to nitrate to produce nitrite, and the bacterium lives very happily. When E. coli uses up all of the nitrate, it doesn't have, as far as I know, any other electron acceptors that it can use. So then it would have to, it would be forced to use or to rely only on fermentation. So that mixed acid fermentation that we talked about, where E. coli can put its electrons onto pyruvate to produce <coughs> lactic acid, ethanol, um, propionic acid, all of those nasty acids that make it a mixed acid fermenter. It will allow the bacterium to survive and to grow, but much less efficiently. So what this is, is kind of a term that some people find oxymoronic when they first hear it. And that's anaerobic respiration. Because we think of respiration, we automatically think of it as being oxygen involving. But for the majority of bacteria in nature, um, probably anaerobic respiration is, is the rule. So E. coli can use only nitrate, so far as I know, as a terminal electron acceptor. But it can't use the nitrite. Other bacteria can reduce nitrate to nitrite, and then turn around and use the nitrite and reduce that to atmospheric nitrogen, or nitrous oxide. Um, or nitric oxide. So there's a tremendous degree of, of biochemical diversity that exists within the bacteria, especially in nature, where they can do this anaerobic respiration. So this is where prokaryotes really have it all over us. So here is one of the paradigms uh, for people who study electron transport in bacteria. Paracoccus to nitrificans, which is a, a gram-negative common soil bacteria, actually has an electron transport chain that evolutionarily is very closely related to ours. So this bacterium, Paracoccus, when you grow it aerobically, that is when you have lots of oxygen, it's going to take its electrons from NADH, put them into this flavor protein, run them through an iron sulfur cluster, coenzyme Q, into the cytochrome complex, into another cytochrome complex. This is very similar to what's going on in our ribos, excuse me, our mitochondria right now with electrons going on to oxygen to produce water. Very similar. 
Paracoccus denitrificans is another example of a facultative anaerobe. So it has the ability to use oxygen when oxygen is present because it can produce massive amounts of energy that way. But because this lives in the soil, and soil is often waterlogged, this bacterium frequently uses up all of the oxygen in its environment. So rather than die or rely entirely on fermentation, it has evolved the ability to change up its cytochrome um, lineup somewhat so that it can do um, anaerobic respiration. So again, the electrons are coming in here at the NADH point into the flavor protein. They're being passed through um, a slightly different array of, of proteins here. But now the electrons can be put onto nitrate to reduce it to nitrite. So that still allows, here are the coupling points. So protons are being pumped across. This bacterium is really good at doing anaerobic respiration. So like E. coli can reduce nitrate to nitrite, just like, per, just like pericoccus can. But E. coli can do nothing with the nitrite. Once pericoccus has used nitrate and turned it into nitrite, it can turn around and now switch and use nitrite as an electron carrier or excuse me, as an, as an electron receptor, because it has different cytochromes, some of which aren't even in the membrane. So these are proteins that are in the periplasm. Remember, this is a gram-negative bacterium. So it can have this cytochrome C, cytochrome B in the, in the periplasm. This is, NIR stands for nitrite reductase. So it can reduce nitrite to nitric, um, to nitric, NO, <laughs> chemistry. Yeah, long time ago. Nitric oxide, um, and, gen and and have a final home for the electrons. That if that NO or NO2 is used up, it can use yet another terminal electron acceptor. In that, this case, nitric oxide. It can reduce nitric oxide to nitrous oxide, and then use nitrous oxide to take it all the way back to atmospheric nitrogen. This is this bacterium and others like it are the reason why we still have 80% nitrogen in our atmosphere. <coughs> because other bacteria that we'll talk about in another section are going to take atmospheric nitrogen and turn it into ammonia and nitrates that we can use. Plants can use those things. If it weren't for bacteria doing this process, which is known as denitrification, we would have long ago sucked all of the nitrogen out of our atmosphere and it would all be tied up in biomass. So part of the nitrogen cycle globally, or not part of the nitrogen cycle, all of the nitrogen cycle globally is intimately associated with microbial um, fermentations and anaerobic respirations like this. So this is a very um, able bacterium in terms of being able to deal with multiple environmental uh, characteristics. But given an oxygen, it behaves pretty much like our mitochondria do. Now, so... Here are some other examples. So these terminal electron acceptors come in all kinds of shapes, flavors, and colors. We and other aerobic organisms, everybody that you know and love, can use oxygen and nothing else. But there are bacteria that can use not only the nitrates and nitrites, but sulfate. Carbon dioxide, we'll talk a lot about this because this has some major implications for global climate change. Um, methanogenic archaea um, can take... CO2 and turn it into methane. We think CO2 is a bad uh, greenhouse gas. Methane is many times more potent as a greenhouse gas. Other bacteria will use elemental sulfur, iron, um, selenium oxide. There is a tremendous diversity in terms of um, the electron, final electron acceptors that anaerobic respiration can use, as opposed to eukaryotes, which are stuck with just one. It is, by the way, I mean, it sounds like I'm, I'm, you know, being disrespectful to eukaryotes. We use it because it is the best. That it's what has allowed us to evolve into this beautiful complexity and size that, that we all have. Uh, because as good as these are for the bacteria, they're all much less efficient, much less efficient in terms of energy production than uh, oxygen. So here's just a, a quote that I like. Life is nothing but an electron looking for a place to rest. That is what life is. It's just electrons moving from things that we oxidize onto a fermentation product or onto, hopefully, in our case, oxygen. Um, I don't know who this physiologist is. I just ran across this quote one time, and I really liked it. OK, and again, remembering my mantra that I want you to understand 
the metabolism of bacteria from a view of 10,000 feet without being encumbered by the memorization of all of the, the steps in the enzyme. I kind of like this slide because it shows how these various parts fit together. So you have the central intermediary metabolism here, something like glycolysis or the Emden-Meyerhoff pathway where glucose um, or some related product is broken down to pyruvic acid. Um, ideally, for maximum energy production, things will shift to the left here towards respiration. So the pyruvic acid can be decarboxylated and fit into the Krebs cycle. And the Krebs cycle, like um, the, glucose, the, the glycolytic pathway, produces reducing power. So this NADH, FADH, these are electrons. These electrons now need to go someplace. If for no other reason than to regenerate NADH, or excuse me, to regenerate NAD, and to regenerate FAD to allow continued Krebs cycle and glycolysis. But if we're lucky, and you and I are, the electrons can be dumped onto the electron transport chain that gets passed along until the electrons go onto oxygen to produce water, and this electron transport chain generates proton motor force. If bacteria don't, either don't have the Krebs cycle or they don't have an available terminal electron acceptor, the system could back up. If, if a bacterium can use only oxygen as its terminal electron acceptor, and there are many bacteria that are that way, obligately aerobic bacteria, if you take away oxygen, the system backs up. There's no place for the electrons to go. So what happens then is that NADH builds up, FADH2 builds up, and oxidation stops. So the Krebs cycle stops, the glycolytic cycle stops. So this forces the bacteria to rely on fermentation. It's much less efficient, but the system, the system in the absence of a place for those electrons to go is shifted to the right in the fermentation, where the electrons here can be put on to pyruvic acid to produce any number of fermentation products, lactic acid being the most simple, but propionic acid, butanol, butyric acid, all of those wonderful end products. Most of these fermentation steps do not produce any energy. I used, to th I used to think that there was no fermentation process that produced energy. There are some bacterial fermentation products that will generate by substrate level phosphorylation, ATP. But most of them, most fermentation products, do nothing more than take the electrons from NADH to recreate NAD to allow glycolysis to occur until hopefully the bacterium finds itself in an environment where there is... Let's, let's say oxygen, which will take away the plug at the end of that electron transport chain. So the bacteria can extract a lot more energy by going through the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. So we've looked now um, at how it is that bacteria get energy. So we haven't really talked about um, pro phototrophy and photosynthesis, um, and we're not going to. We will, come, we will use the sunlight for something else a little bit later. So we've largely gone with um, chemotrophy. So using um, materials that we can reduce going through the electron transport chain. But that electron transport chain, as we talked about, generates proton motor force. So those protons being pumped across, making a, a charge differential across the plasma membrane. And we've talked in two examples already in bacterial flagellar rotation, and the act of transport of nutrients into the cell of how the proton motor force is used to, to do these two forms of, of work. But lastly, we want to see what's the major um, advantage to using this proton motor force, and that's oxidative phosphorylation. So the use of proton motor force generated by the electron transport chain to take ADP and inorganic phosphate and generate ATP, the currency of the cell. And so I think you already know the end of this story because this is what you've all learned about when you learn in cell biology about how ATP is generated in the mitochondria. So it's the use of this little nanomachine called the F0F1 ATP synthase. I wish textbooks would standardize whether down is inside the cell or outside the cell. They always switch them around and it always messes with my head. In this particular one, the periplasm or the external environment is down here. Um, the cytoplasm is up here.
So the F0 portion of this complex motor is embedded within the plasma membrane. And again, don't worry about the subunits here. I just want you to understand how this, how this machine works. So here's the proton motive force reflected by these three yellow protons. So these protons can be passed across the F0 portion and released into the cytoplasm. Again, there's a decrease in potential energy now because there's less of a charge differential across that membrane, and that decreased potential energy is now captured as work. The work here is rotation. So in a way, this is similar to the bacterial flagellum. It uses different proteins than the MOT A and MOT B proteins in the flagellum, which helped to rotate clockwise or counterclockwise that MOT protein, but it still generates um, a rotational force through here. That rotational force will change the conformation of these proteins on the cytoplasmic side, the F, which collectively is referred to as the F1 portion of this. These proteins, as they alternatively change conformation using the torque generated in F0, can take inorganic phosphate from the solution and ADP and generate ATP. So you can see a very stark difference between substrate level phosphorylation which is where ATP was generated using a phosphate group that was on the substrate, on the molecule being oxidized, to oxidative phosphorylation, the much more efficient pathway where inorganic phosphate from solution is now added via this enzyme to ADP to generate ATP. So here's a, a, an animation that, that kind of shows this as well. Um, I've had this animation for about 15 years, and about 15 years ago, this was like, wow, state of the art. I couldn't believe it when I found this on, on the internet. Now this is kind of, um, kind of old, but it still shows the, the principle. So here's the outside of the cell, or the periplasm of the bacterium, with lots of protons shown as these purple pluses that can move through in a, in a gated fashion into the cytoplasm, and is generating torque in, in this portion, the F0 portion, uh, embedded in the membrane. And as that rotates, you can see conformation changes on the F1 portion in the cytoplasm. You can see ADP entering in one particular conformation, along with inorganic phosphate. And then as it rotates further, it will, after forming that high energy phosphorylation hydride bond, it will release it. So now you're looking from inside the cell, here's the inorganic phosphate and adenosine diphosphate. Both of these will enter when the protein is in one conformation. You can see that torque continues, and now the high energy phosphorylation hydride bond is formed, so the gamma phosphoryl group is added. Another turn will now change the conformation again to release ATP um, to, to go ahead and, and do the work. So it's, in many ways, it's very similar to um, the flagellar rotation. But the work here is different. It's not for motility. It's for the generation of, of ATP. So this is how that works. OK, now, again, back on my soapbox about how wonderful bacterial physiology is, even though I don't consider myself a bacterial physiologist, is that fundamentally, most eukaryotic cells, like you and I, produce ATP through either ethanolic fermentation. We don't do that very much. Yeast do it. Um, but we use it mostly through aerobic respiration. Look at all of the things that bacteria and archaea can do physiologically that we can't. And again, I don't expect you to remember these, but all of these unique fermentations that, that um, they have, anaerobic respiration, to me the most fascinating thing about microbial physiology is the ability to do respiration completely independently of oxygen. Uh, also, fat, lithotrophy the use of inorganic substances. We can't, you know, we, we find hydrogen sulfide toxic. It would kill us. Um, but many microbes find it perfectly delicious and that's their energy source. Um, the ability to do photosynthesis without involving oxygen. You've all learned photosynthesis that releases oxygen by plants, but bacteria initially invented it um, to do this in the absence of oxygen. And the thanogenesis. When we talk about archaea, and our key is role in the environment, we'll talk a lot more about this because this is a really critical ecological term where you really need to understand bacterial, or in this case, archaeal physiology. Because methanogenesis, the ability to biologically produce methane, can only be done by archaea. 
There is not a eukaryotic cell on Earth. There is not a bacterial cell on Earth that can biologically produce methane. We can do it industrially, so I guess in a way you can consider that we are methanogens, but, but really we're not. Our here are the only organisms that can do that. And so methane is so important for, for greenhouse gas. Um, I could go through all of these things, but honestly I don't understand light-driven non-photosynthetic photophosphorylation, so I won't even mention it other than that. So the other thing that I think, so, so I, and again, this is just my appeal for people to understand bacterial physiology, is that in terms of bioremediation, microbes are so critical. So if you think about most of the pollutants that we're associated, that, that you know, are associated with our environment, many of them are coming from petrochemicals. So, so things like toluene or, or methylbenzene, whichever you prefer to call it or aniline dyes, or nitrobenzene, which comes from our explosives. These are you know, all based on benzene rings, which are very stable, um, and they're very um, important pollutants. But there are always microbes that can break these things down. Um, so microbes can oxidatively break down toluene into benzoate, then into catechol, and it all feeds into the TCA cycle. It just all depends on whether the microbe has a pathway that allows it to use this molecule to help this poor pelican who's soaked in oil off the coast of Santa Barbara. Um, I didn't take the picture, I found it in the book. Um, to help remediate some of the things, some of the horrible things that we do to our, to our environment. Um, and to put them into things that we all understand as being non-toxic, like pyruvate. Because these molecules, as toxic as we might find them, as disgusting as we might find them, can simply be turned into molecules that fit into the everyday, ordinary TCA cycle of these bacteria. So in terms of bioremediation, bacterial physiology is really where it's, where it's all about. So the big take-home picture about this is that prokaryotic cells exhibit very little morphologic diversity. That's why we only looked in the microscopes in the lab for two weeks. That's it. You've seen pretty much all of the morpho morphologic diversity. But in terms of biologic diversity or metabolic diversity, there's just orders of magnitude greater diversity in the prokaryotes, archaea and bacteria, than, than there are in all of the eukaryotic domain. Um, okay, so I didn't think I was going to get this far. I must be going fast. How are we moving for time? This last section I kind of thrown in as a way to show why it is that eukaryotic cells have developed such morphologic diversity. Why it is that we find eukaryotic organisms much more beautiful because these are the organisms that you think of when you think of tropical rainforests and, and coral reefs. Why is it that we, eukaryotes, who've been around such a shorter time than prokaryotes, have developed such greater size, such greater, physi uh, not physiologic diversity, but morphologic diversity? So it seems a little bit unrelated, but I, I kind of want to, to go through this. So, so prokaryotes are biochemically much more inventive than, than eukaryotes. If there's a chemical reaction that exists that will yield energy, there is a bacterium on Earth someplace that is going to use that chemical reaction to generate energy. So eukaryotes don't have very bi much biochemical capability, but they are much more beautiful, right? We all are, you know, we just, we just love to see these animals um, in zoos and in nature shows um, and as you walk around campus, even, even the squirrels. Um, <laughs> But if you think about this in terms of quantitative terms, in terms of the genetics, and in terms of the energetics of, the, of these different organisms, it will become hopefully quite obvious to you why eukaryotes have such an advantage over prokaryotes. So the mean protozoan genome, um, the haploid genome, has about 20,000 genes. So this would be like a paramecium or an amoeba, right? So a simple, single, single cellular eukaryotic organism. Um, has many more genes than a typical prokaryotic, a bacterial genome. So E. coli, for instance, is about 6 million bases, I think, in size. It has about 5,000 genes. So much, much smaller. So what is the aspect of eukaryotic biology that's allowed the eukaryotic domain to evolve so much more structural complexity and beauty? It's all about energetics. It's all about the fact that that fusion about 2 billion years ago that I talked about, I think, in the very first lecture, where an ancient archaeal cell fused with an ancient bacterial cell, and they actually stuck and made it work. I'm sure it was a fight at first between those two cells. 
but they made it work, like, you know, it's like a difficult marriage, right? You know, you, you, you fight, but you love each other, and you eventually come to, uh, I wouldn't know, so I have a great marriage, but, um, but I, I see it on TV. But, so what's happened is, it's all about the energetics of, of a eukaryotic cell having many of these mitochondria present in there. So prokaryotes, actually, because they have a higher met metabolic rate, are actually really good at producing energy because of their high metabolism rate. But the energy generated by proton motor force um, supports a single genome. But most of that energy budget that that bacterium has, 75% of which is used just to express messenger RNA and make proteins. So it doesn't have a lot of energy left to put in the bank or to play with um, or to develop novel physical characteristics, to get bigger, um, to develop feathers, to develop wings, to develop um, fur. Eukaryotes, on the other hand, have hundreds or perhaps thousands of mitochondria within their cytoplasmic cells. So in remembering that these mitochondria are simply nothing more than prokaryotic endosymbionts, the, the all, every one of them, the descendant of a single event that happened about two billion years ago, the fusion of two life forms um, into a single... So now you have all of the energy from all of those endosymbionts collectively serving a single eukaryotic genome. The genome is larger, but if you have hundreds or thousands of endosymbionts all producing a little bit more energy than they need, that's a massive energy budget for the eukaryotic cell to have. Because of that energy budget, it's allowed for genome expansion. That's why the genomes of eukaryotic cells are so much larger than bacterial cells. That's why they have such structural complexity. That's why they've been able to evolve um, a lot more in terms of protein families. So this early acquisition of endosymbionts, both mitochondria and chloroplasts, um, in eukaryotes has allowed evolvability because of, because of the increased energy. So you can look at this quantitatively as, as well. I, I always hesitate to do anything quantitative in, in microbiology because um, I'm not a quantitative biologist. But if you look at the metabolic rate of an aerobic bacterium. It's measured in watts per gram, 0.19 watts per gram. Again, the numbers here, this is for your appreciation. If, if there was any question on an exam about this, it would be very general. It wouldn't require you to do any calculation. But the mean metabolic rate for that single cellular, simple eukaryotic cell is much lower, right? So 0 0.06 watts per, per gram. Um, which is a joule per second, for those of you who are interested in this. So actually, in terms of metabolic rate, bacteria have it all over the prokaryote. So more than three times the metabolic rate. So you might think, well, then why is it that the prokaryote has such a better energy? Because remember that this is measured per gram. And bacteria are so much smaller than eukaryotic cells. So the cellular masses are very different. The typical bacterium is 2.6 times 10 to the minus 12 grams. And although I know that this is not, I should have expressed this as 4.0 times 10 to the, what, 8th, but I kept it at minus 12. So you can see that there is just many orders of magnitude difference in the mass of that simple single cellular paramecium compared to, compared to a bacterium. So based on size, the eukaryote has 200, or 2300 picowatts per cell compared to 0.49 for the eukaryotes. That's a huge energy budget. That's a massive um, advantage that the eukaryotic cell, the bacteria, doesn't have. This is what has allowed all of the new families of proteins that um, eukaryotes have to arise. It's allowed the development of much more sophisticated gene regulation. Luckily, bacteria have relatively simple gene regulation because we're going to spend a lot of time talking about bacterial gene regulation. And just as you think about it, as you become bored with it, think, God, I'm glad this isn't eukaryotic regulation because eukaryotic gene regulation is much more um, elegant and much more complicated than bacteria, as complicated as bacteria might seem to you when we, when we start talking about regulatory mechanisms. It evolved, this is what has allowed eukaryotic cells to evolve complexity well beyond what prokaryotic cells have. Oops, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> It's a car, you know, maybe on the last day of class. Um, so we have a couple minutes left, so I want to make sure that people understand the exam policy. So exam material stops now. I'll put up another slide set later this afternoon that will start on Friday. But the material for the exam next week ends now.
Now, in terms of the exam, there is, for those of you who want to have an exam with me present in the room so that you can ask questions, some, some people like that, you can take the exam with me on Wednesday evening, next Wednesday evening, in ISC 1127. I'll post that. That's where the room is going to be. From, I think it's 5.30 to 7.30, or maybe it's 6 to 8. 5.30? You don't have to take it then. You can take it any time between Wednesday, next Wednesday morning and next Friday afternoon. You just have to email me at that other email address. Please email my, it's in the syllabus, my microbe doc microbemark.gmail.com. I don't want to know. I don't need to know why. I just need to know when to expect you at my office. You'll be able to come by my office, pick up an exam that should be waiting for you with your name on my office door. You can then go to the library. You can go to your dorm room. You can go to the green room. I'm a big fan of the honor system. I trust people not to screw me over on this. I haven't found out, you know, so far as I know, of any cheating or widespread cheating, um, because I'll discontinue the policy as soon as that happens. So, but I, I'm very trusting about this. So take the exam, take it wherever you want, bring it back to my office. If I'm not there, there's another file folder on my office door for you to put in finished exams. I will also leave my cell phone number so that if you can't find me and you do have questions, you can text me the questions, or you can text me where to find you. So anytime, as long as you don't start it after 4 o'clock on Friday, because I don't want to have to stay late on, on Friday. Okay, that's it. I'll see you guys um, on Friday. so that you probably wouldn't finish it in an hour, but some people always do. But it's designed to basically take away the stress of I don't okay. have enough time to do it. Great. That's another reason why I don't do it in class, because then you have to worry about the other class coming right. in. Okay. Um, and if you should need more than two hours, it's not a problem. Okay. Thank you. Sure.